The truth is that our players, when we have people watch it say, hey, I can't believe how great these athletes are, but I can learn something from them and incorporate that into my game. Look, how they approach that shot, it's different than someone who's just so young and athletic that could get to a ball that you probably, you know, at our age now, we probably never be able to do it. So I think that's one of the other things that people, when they experience it, you know, live or watching it through our broadcasts or through our streaming, they definitely can learn something and, and really see some great pickleball. Hello, welcome back to the future of pickleball. This is the show where we meet the movers and shakers, the people that are making this sport go at this insane rate that it's happening. I've got two men on today that are really going to be fun to talk to. I've got Paul Pamundo, who's the CEO of the new National Pickleball League, Romy Maxey, who's one of the team owners and is developing a phenomenal new club in Houston, Texas. Gentlemen, welcome to the future of pickleball. Thank you for having us, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Hey, you bet. You know, I'll tell you, I'd like to start off, Paul Bamundo, the CEO, tell us a little bit, frankly, first about your your adventure in pickleball. How did you get involved? How did this all come together for you? Well, it's a long story, and it involves me being at a Jackson Brown concert, but um, <laughs> I, I, re I received a text message about, was I interested in running a pickleball league? And I loved the game, and it started a conversation, and over the course of many months, uh, got to explore the National Pickleball League and what they were doing in their inaugural season. And where I met you, Paul, at, at uh, Glendale and our championships in, in Arizona last year. And it kind of took it from there. I, I really um, became enamored not only with the sport overall, but, but the approach that the National Pickleball League had for champions pros and the team concept and treating women and men equally in terms of our teams and our points and men's doubles, women's doubles and mixed doubles. So it just kind of took off from there for me. You know, you're mentioning a couple of things that I've got in my notes that I really want to delve into a little bit because I, I do really, what I've seen of what you guys are doing, but I think our public would like to know, kind of give us a little bit of a description of how you see your league formed and what the core elements are. Yeah, so we, we started last year with six teams and then we expanded now to 12 teams and Romy uh, and his colleagues and, and the Houston uh, hammers came on board this year so we're really excited to now have 12 teams and we now have uh, there'll be over 200 players who will experience the national pickleball league we have 186 rostered players um equally men and women as i said so either between 14 or 16 players per team seven or eight women we're just giving some roster flexibility based on subs and how many people we need to be there and they will play in a round robin format where they'll eventually play all of each other uh, we travel around to different locations where there are great indoor facilities. One of them happens to be in Houston, where Romy's home base is for the Houston Hammers. Uh, we finished off uh, our first event in Chicago a couple of weeks ago, and we're coming up on our second event in Columbus. And we basically have one event per month starting in May. So May, June, July, August, September, and our championships in October. And in the preseason, we had our... Um, combines, as I'd like to tell my friends who I used to work with uh, at the NFL and the NBA, it's not like we're asking people to run 40-yard dashes and measuring their hands and their vertical leap. Um, we had all of our players and potential players playing in front of Romy and his other fellow owners to try out for the league. So that's the basic concept, and it's a team-based concept, and, and, and we love it. Very cool. You know, Romy, if we could, um, now I've known Romy Maxey for quite a while, and I, I met him, oh, years ago, a very, very involved man in everything pickleball in Texas. Romy, how did you develop this idea? First of all, maybe tell us a little bit about what the Pickleball Country Club is, and then I want to talk about how you see it interfacing with your NPL ownership. I appreciate that. Uh, Paul, the reason I got started in pickleball, because I heard a, a guy named Paul Olson was playing, and I <laughs> said, hey, I've got to play. If that guy's playing, 
I've got a play. So that's how I got started. <laughs> so um, we, I was involved with the MPL last year. Had an opportunity to be asked to be a super sub, which is was the category of anybody got hurt, um, anything of that nature, pulled a hammy, then I would go in and play and substitute in those lines. And I just got excited about it. Of course, I had great friends in the organization. Uh, Rick Witzkin and some of the founders were close friends of mine, Beth and, of course, Mike, and and then got to meet Paul as we came along. Uh, but it's just a fabulous organization of team-oriented play versus the uh, just doubles play in tournaments and things of that nature. The camaraderie that's uh, developed within the team's concept itself is just tremendous. And so with that excitement, I was able to get with uh, three other people. I might uh, share their names, Amy Bloom Rosen, Hal Martin, who is also my partner in the club, and then uh, Hugh Zhang. And the four of us, we partnered up, decided we wanted to become a team, uh, got with the founders, got with Paul, and we were able to secure a, a, a team. And we are actually the only team in the league that has a home base at this point. Now, there's some other ones that are considering building a facility and doing some things, but we're proud to mention that we have Pickleball Country Club here in Houston that will be our home base, and we are actually hosting the September event. So that was kind of the initial involvement and excitement of getting involved with the program. Then we said, hey, let's, let's buy one. Let's get it going. And I want to come back to some of those things. But, Paul, I'd like to jump back in. When – when when you first when the league was first formed and there were the original six teams and then not too long after that if i'm correct the expansion the six expansion teams took it to 12 was there a particular focus on what locations what cities or was it the ownership groups that drove that how did that come about it's really a combination i mean naturally as you guys know um florida is is very much a big epicenter of pickleball. So in the first year, we had two of our teams in Florida. So one in Naples and one in Boca. We had a team in Indianapolis, a team in Oklahoma City, um, and then a team in Denver. Um, and basically, you know, as we kind of thought about where else we could be, it was important for us to think about what other parts of the country we would be in. So Houston was a natural one. When we talked to Romy and his group, we wanted to be elsewhere in the south. We've got two teams now on, out west one in Coachella Valley um, in California, one in Seattle, um, one team in the Northeast now in Princeton, closer to me where I am in Connecticut, um, and two teams in the Midwest. So one in Kansas City um, and then another in Columbus. And so it's definitely a, a little bit of an art and a science, right, where we find the right group of owners who have the right mentality of how we want to build this community and really in it for the right reasons of building um, pickleball and specifically pickleball, the Champions Pro 50 plus level, but also believe in our philosophy of going to indoor facilities for a variety of reasons for the best play that we could have, not having to deal with weather delays, not having to deal with wind or sun. Um, and so, like Romy said, he's in a particularly uh, interesting spot that they have a facility. Many of our other owners are considering doing that themselves or affiliating themselves with some indoor facilities where we're playing. You know, Romy, as we as we talk about that, and given the fact that I've known you for a while, and I've I've, I've been, you've included me in some of the, your plans of what you're doing with the country club, the pickleball country club in Houston. Guide me a little bit as to how you think, as an owner of a club and a facility, that your involvement in a in a a a, 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 a ownership position of an NPL team, how does that factor into your club operation? We're, well, you know, we wanted to have something that. No one else. There's several clubs in Houston. We wanted to have something different than all the other clubs, too. So that different was getting Houston area. I think we've got a 50 mile radius of Houston as well as our borders. And so no one else can come into Houston, basically, with an MPL team, which is kind of exciting to us because now we can monetize on that to some degree in promoting our MPL. As a matter of fact, I have an event tomorrow at a different club that we're going out to promote the Houston Hammers. And we're going to give away some swag and do some things and have some open play at a different facility. We want to spread the word throughout Houston about the Houston Hammers and make it a family affair as well. But yet our, our club, of course, is the home base for the, for the event and those kinds of things. But we want to spread the word out uh, all over Houston. It's a new professional team, just like the Houston Astros or the Rockets. We're the Houston Hammers. 
Very cool. Very cool. So, Paul, um, when when you're doing this where you've got 11 other clubs in addition to the Houston Hammers that don't have specific facilities, how will they be managing their events and their practices and their training and the team building and brand building that they need to do for their individual clubs? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's something that uh, we, we do envision over time expanding to such a degree where like where I, I worked at the NBA. So for the National Basketball Association, getting to a point of having 30 some odd teams where we would have a home and away games for each of the teams like Romy would be playing against one of the teams that would come and play an individual match in years ahead. But right now we're, you know, the right size where we could all travel together. So we do have all the teams last year was six this year, 12 all traveling together the same weekends to play each other. Um, over time that will change, right? So the reason why we're in certain facilities, Romy's is a great one with the pickleball club there in, in Houston. Um, the other ones happen to be in the Midwest this year, just to, just where there are uh, facilities that, that, that are available. So the one that we have in Algonquin, Illinois, uh, one coming up in Columbus, then one in Cincinnati. Um, and then we're going to be part of PickleCon in uh, Kansas City, which we're really excited about in August. And then we're going to Romy's facility for our last regular season match. Um, to us, I think that's the right model now. And we're working with our individual teams with the clubs to help promote themselves by putting, say, branding in our uniforms, right? Right now, we don't have a brand that goes across the league on our uniforms. We eventually will. But we have many of our teams taking advantage of putting their primary sponsor or, you know, multiple sponsors on our uniform. Um, there are other ways that they could do things um, with social media, other things, doing things locally, like Romy's saying, um, in their individual market. And we encourage that and support that as a league. So. We think there's a lot of possibility both now and in the future for sponsorship, merchandising, licensing. You know, eventually um, we, we now stream all of our matches. We have a relationship with CBS uh, where we had our championships on CBS last year. We'll have another event coming up on CBS. So we're running it like a professional league in any other sport. Very nice. You know, one of the things that I try and do on this show is I try and have people who might watch this from desperate parts of the country learning about possibilities or things that they might want to do. What is the formula that a club has to have for you to be able to host an NPL event in? What is the size and number of courts? Yeah, well, I mean, it's changed, right, from last year to this year. This year. Last year, we had a very good relationship with Chicken and Pickle. Then they, their facilities had courts that worked for us because we only needed six to play on. Um, of course, having more than six was important, too, to have practice courts and such. Um, this year, we're, we most of our facilities that we're in have 12 or more courts to play on um, because we've got the 12 teams. So we may decide to shift in the future if we expand next year to, let's say, you know, a few more teams, maybe 16. We might have an Eastern and a Western conference, sure. and then we can go back to facilities that have smaller amounts of courts. So it really depends. But but our sweet spot right now that we've had is north of 12 courts um, and being able to play you know, all of our teams at the same time. You know, uh, Romy, given the fact that you've been so deeply involved in the game of pickleball and the growth of it for years now in, in primarily the Texas market, how do you see the NPL factoring into the overall uh, um, atmosphere of pickleball and the culture of pickleball? I think one of the really neat things is the fact that uh, pickleball started out, at least in the beginning, it was considered to be an older person's game. And now, of course, I think the numbers are uh, showing that it's a younger person's game as well, because I think the last thing I saw was like 33 years of age is the average age now playing, which is great for pickleball. But we still, we had this area of people that are over 50 that are still outstanding players that needed a venue, needed an opportunity to continue playing. Because uh, for the most professional athletes, you're you know 35 to 38 years of age, uh, you're kind of washed up in to most degrees in, in any professional sport. And so you have that void now between 38 years of age to where do I go to 50? So you have 12 years. So one of the things, uh, you know, that we're considering, uh, Paul, we, we're actually considering, I think, having even maybe a younger person come into our league next year. Hope I'm not spilling any beans, but we might have a, a person over 45. We already have one over 60. You have to have an individual over 60 in, in on each club. 
which kind of, so now we've got from 50 to 65 playing regularly in the league and excited. And it just brings a whole other venture to the whole game. It's just, it's just fun. Yeah. Expand on that a little bit, because I was not aware of that. Tell me a little bit more about how this, because I assume that it was when it's 50 plus and it's a champions tour. Get, give us the details of how those other ages factor in. Well, one of the things that we uh, feel like that we can monetize on as far as our club in Houston is concerned, just to give you an example, is we want to have minor leagues. We will be hosting a minor league NPL uh, league a season, and we'll invite anybody over 45 to be in that league. So we want them thinking about, even if we stay at 50 in the league, but we want them thinking about, hey, I, you know, in three more years, I can be part of the NPL. It's the excitement of, of, of a professional organization, a team that I might have a chance to be part of and uh, the excitement of that. So monetizing somewhat on a league or, or, or some sort of, and we want to expand to all of the clubs in Houston. Each one of them have a minor league team. And mm-hmm. now it culminates in a, in a really neat format that it's building. We want to have our own combines. When I say a combine, we'll have our own local combines where we bring in the talent, uh, take a look at them. And then what we can't promise them a draft pick, but what we can maybe promise them is uh, we're working with the league now, Paul, uh, to maybe get a, uh, a combine position. In other words, the winner of our combine gets a combine position to go to the real combine that, that the league hosts. So that gives them some incentive that, you know, if I win the local uh, combine, I get a, I get an opportunity because last year we had a wait list on people that actually wanted to go to the combines. You know, Paul, uh, I was very familiar with what you guys were doing with the combine. I liked it. Um, I'm pretty well connected in the sport. I actually was getting some feedback from some very elite level players on the West Coast that were a little frustrated because there wasn't a West Coast combine. Is that anything that you're considering? Oh, yeah. I mean, we only had one combine last year. We expanded the two. We ambitiously thought we might have three, and we're trying to find a, a Western location. Now, in the end, we did have one in Florida and one in Dallas, so we were somewhat west, <laughs> you know, obviously more south than west. Uh, we couldn't get all the way uh, to the west coast. It just wasn't the right uh, timing, the right facility, all the reasons that we couldn't do it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're very conscious of trying to have our uh, events overall, not just our combines uh, across the country in different places. I do know a place yeah. in Texas where they can have a combine next year, by the way. Yeah, I'm sure that <laughs> well, there's another good place. At, at, but I do want to point out to you, Paul, you must be an East Coaster when you're talking about Dallas. Dallas is the middle. That's not oh, the I West. Know, I, know. <laughs> I, I, I for sure am an East Coaster. I'm a New Yorker. And it's funny because I've lived in Connecticut now 15 years. So whenever I, mean, whenever I say, oh, I'm from New York, I'm like, well, actually, now that you know, I'm married and have kids, like I've, I've been living in Connecticut for 15 years. But yes, very much a Northeastern guy. If you're an avid player, if you're going to want to have the Selkirk TV app on your phone, The Selkirk TV app is a free streaming and on-demand app dedicated to pickleball. It's one source for all the content you're looking for. If you're learning, we have teaching, coaching, we have the best podcasters in the sport, and we even have 24-7 streaming of new content daily. When you have the app downloaded, you'll get early access to everything you could want in pickleball, and you'll be the first one to get all the buzz. Watch live coverage of the PPA tournament matches from the Grandstand Court and see insightful pro player interviews. Selkirk has it all. You can dive into the action anytime, anywhere you want. So download the app right now. I promise you'll love it. You know, something that I think is going to be really cool about seeing what happens with the NPL is uh, I, I got great feedback personally from having been at your championships that you did at chicken and pickle in Glendale was very cool. I got invited by one of your, one of your members, one of your Texas ladies that uh, said, Oh, I'm playing there. You want to come over? So I came over and saw it. I was really impressed. You've got such a great vibe going with the, really the core of the original pickleball community of the 50 plus community, they want to get involved and they want to see this. How will a spectator experience be as you go forward with this? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely part of the design. I mean, we're not, we're not 
right now charging for tickets, as you saw, right? But we want people to come. We, 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 even our first event in Algonquin, we had a tremendous response and a lot of people there. We're expecting that to continue to build. We want to provide as much access as we can through, you know, our live stream and going to NPLPickleball.com and figuring out, you know, what's going on pre-event, during the event, post-event. Um, and in fact, in the, the next place that we'll be in Columbus, we, we will have a stadium seated um, center court with bleachers, which we're excited about. So we're, we're, we're definitely designing for the future where we'll have spectators absolutely in mind and involved. And we know most of our spectators are also players. So we're also building in ways that hopefully they could watch and maybe play earlier in the week too. And after we're done play, because we know that that's so much of the beauty of this sport is it's a very much a participatory sport and people of all ages could play. I mean, my 13 and 11 year old right now in Connecticut are taking it as part of their physical education requirement. Oh, very nice. Wonderful. You know, so yes, we're concentrated on champions pros, but we love growing the game really across the board. Well, and, and that to me is really the, the, the module that I think is most important of all of the guests that I try and get on the show. It really is how do they contribute somehow, some way to the growth of the sport and, and the thing that I'm so excited about seeing NPL, I, I wish I was maybe five, 10 years younger, but, uh, but I'm not. And so uh, I've got to deal with that. But I was going to say that the, the ability, when people get a chance to see what a, what a champions tour level players game looks like, I think they're going to be blown away because we get, have gotten so wrapped up in the PPA and the MLP and the APP thinking that the pro game is only about young people. I'm going to tell you, if you're watching this and you get a chance to see an NPL event, you'll see amazing pickleball. I think that'll contribute greatly to the game overall. Yeah, I agree. And I just want one thing on that, Paul, I just wanted to say quickly is that we've found um, that the players in our league, people who play and watch them, it's much more relatable, right? So as much as we all like watching the young pros and we all wish we were probably five, 10, 20 years younger ourselves. Um, the truth is that our players, when we have people watch it say, hey, I can't believe how great these athletes are, but I could learn something from them and incorporate that into my game. Like how they approach that shot, it's different than someone who's just so young and athletic that could get to a ball that you probably, you know, at our age now, we probably never be able to do it. So I think that's one of the other things that people, when they experience it, you know, live or watching it through our broadcasts or through our streaming, they definitely can learn something and, and really see some great pickleball. Paul, Paul, if you don't mind, I'll interject yeah. a little bit something. Yeah, please. One of the things that we also, uh, uh, we're doing some pro-ams prior to the tournaments themselves or the, or the events, I'll call them events. Um, so like for Columbus, uh, one of our uh, players is from Columbus, uh, named Sherry Cordery. She was our first round draft pick, as a matter of fact. But the point is that she works at a different club in the Columbus area that where we're actually hosting the event. But we're having a pro am. We're bringing in eight or ten of the hammers, and we're going to host a little pro am. Have a really good time. Bring those folks in. And again, it's a different way of monetizing to some degree, not for our team, but for our players because they have expenses. Sure. So, so, so what we're doing is having this pro-am and then whatever we can make during that pro-am, we're contributing it back to the players for their, for their hotels and for their, you know, any flights and things that they may have. So we're helping them out in that way. But the other thing that I really want to interject and it's funny is we actually are a very loud, boisterous team at the event. And the very first event, we, we've got our chants, we've got our yells and our group, and, and so we had, so we are going to teach all the people that come to our pro am our chance, and we're going to encourage them to come to our, to the event and and uh, in Columbus. And we already had a couple of the players come up to some of ours and go, you know, you guys are a little bit annoying and noisy and loud. <laughs> and I said, and, and you know, what our response was, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> yeah, very cool, very cool. You know, I'll tell you, I, I I think that there's so many possibilities when we do these things in a team environment. Um, I've been a big believer that the sport of pickleball could really flourish in a team environment pretty much across the board. So I'm really excited to see what you do with that. You know, Paul, as we're starting to kind of get to where we'll, we'll be a, begin to wind this thing down a little bit, guide me a little bit as to what you're coming from your pretty amazing background in the pro sports world. 
What's your vision, let's say three to five years of what you think the NPL can accomplish? Yeah, and it's interesting you talk about like how important the team concept is. I've, I've always been involved in team sports. Yes, I played some individual sports, but I've been a team sports person. And we've had such good response from people that have come from other team sports. Like, for instance, Danny Werfel, you guys may remember that name. He's Heisman Trophy winner, played in the NFL. He's now one of our players. He loved this whole idea. He got into pickleball like many people did during COVID, playing with his children, playing with his son. And he got hooked into it in such a way that he couldn't stop playing. And he became yeah. very, very good, came to our combine, got drafted. And we hear from people all the time, whether they came from more natural sports like, you know, tennis or ping pong or, you know, other racket sports. Um, we're getting people from all different walks of life that are now coming into the sport. And that's what we see for the future is we think there are going to be, as Romy said, people extending their careers. Most of the people in our league have other careers. They might be, you know, a PhD like Romy or, you know, another kind of doctor or a lawyer or, you know, a tech entrepreneur or, or a business person, whatever they might be in their other walks of life, that they are doing this at a professional level um, to become a professional pickleball player. We love affording people that opportunity. So in three years and five years, we see continued expansion. We want to be everywhere across the country, you know, more teams involved. Um, and we're just really excited about what the future has in store. Very nice. I, I, I tell you, I really find it exciting. You know, Romy, as being a now an investor and a club owner and an investor and a team owner in NLP or NPL, how do you how do you see the next three to five years from a pure business model for somebody who might be watching this, who's interested in getting into the game sort of at the level that you have? What would be your advice or your suggestions to them? Um, uh, on the NPL side, I think it's just the expansion that we're going to be going through over the next three to five years. And and uh, we have the first year to the second year, the costs of the teams went up and we anticipate the cost of the third year going up. So purchasing a team, the value in itself uh, is, is one, one way. But I think the thing that we want to look at is how do we, um, sponsorships and, and things that we can do to, we've already have about a half a dozen in kind sponsorships. We, we were able to get the, uh, players, all shoes, I'll throw my Acacia out there. They we were able to get them all Acacia shoes. For example, we got them sunglasses, indoor glasses, uh, for play. One of the things that we're thinking about making a requirement for our 50 and over MPL next year is protective eyewear. Mm -hmm. uh, and because the paddles are getting hotter and faster. And so it's just a, a good idea. So, but in kind uh, sponsorships are coming in uh, pretty, pretty steady. So we're going to monopolize off of that and go into the other sponsorships and with the hospitals and the orthopedics and the people that really back, you know, 50 and over play. So there's a lot of opportunities in the MPL to be successful. You just have to sometimes think outside the box a little bit. To, to make it work, but it's it's not a stretch to see the successes that I think the MPL teams are going to have, and I don't think it's going to be hard for Paul and his group to to be able to locate other owners that are going to have interest in being a part of this organization and uh, coming. By the way, the most annoying team at the tournament is now the championship team going into Columbus. I might add. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking forward to defending our title in Columbus. Good, good. You know, I'll tell you, it's been very cool to talk to you guys about this. And, and one of the things that I've enjoyed so much about the show that I do is it gives me an opportunity to talk to people who, who all are visionaries in one form or another of having to think about some new, interesting way of, of, of adding something to our sport of pickleball. I think you guys are doing a great job. I'm really going to be excited to watch, Romy, what you're doing in Houston, given the fact that you've got a a, a club itself. Well, you have 13 courts, I think, don't you, at your club? Yes, sir, 13. And so the second one right now with nine more. And and it is, but but the idea of that is sort of a case study or a model. I, I think we've got so many builders, developers, um, investors coming into the sport of pickleball. We need case studies. It'll be fun to watch what you do. And if you don't mind, I may stay in touch with you to kind of report on that from time to time. Absolutely. So cool. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for spending the time with me today. Paul Bamundo, 
Roby Maxi, it's been a gas. I wish you all the luck in the world, and I'm looking forward to showing up at some NPL events. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Please come anytime. We'd love to have you. Good. Always welcome. Always welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you.